Hey there, we're back again. Assetto Corsa. This time we're doing something a little bit differently. We are doing the Targa Florio, a 72 kilometer track that is set in Sicily, Italy. And uh, not for the weak of heart. This is actually one of the oldest sports car racing events. It started in 1906, was the first one. Ran all the way through until the last national event in 77, 1977. And, um, I think that they stopped uh, running it on the uh, uh, the actual GT calendar in 1973. So really an amazing race. We'll talk a little bit more about it and its uniqueness and also why I'm in a Porsche 904. Let's get on and drive. I have adjusted the time clock a little bit. It is early morning in Sicily, Italy. Partly cloudy skies. Could make for some nice, uh, nice scenery in the sky. There are two versions of this track. One, I think, is the original author. And uh, it's partially done. None of the buildings have real detail, no cars, no trees, no real vegetation at all. The road seems to be in really good shape though, so it's drivable, just not very enjoyable as something to look at. This is the Simtrax version. Now, Simtrax, I guess, has kind of a mixed reputation. primarily cemented in the fact that they tend to take other people's work and uh, do a little bit of this, that, and the other, but still leave the track largely unfinished and then sell it for a cost. I don't know about all that. I just know what I read in the Reddits. This is the Simtrax version. I did pay for it. Not much, but it did cost. But it's got trees, buildings are complete. There's some cars on the sides of the road. Um, so it's the one that I chose to use, but I'll leave links to both versions in the description of the video and you can make your own choice. Yeah, I'm never against a group or individual taking a incomplete project and uh, doing some work on it, making it better than it was. It's better if they do so with the original author's permission. Don't just reuse their work, obviously. But if somebody leaves something in an abandoned state, incomplete, it makes sense if you have a love for it to complete it, but there are right ways and wrong ways to do that sort of thing too. So um, I just want to make it clear that I'm not necessarily endorsing sim tracks, but I did like this track. And uh, I feel it was worth the money that I paid for it. So, Targa Florio. An amazing race, like I said before, has history dating back to 1906. One of the earliest and longest running motorsport events of its type. Has kind of an interesting story around... Uh, doing starts a little bit differently uh, you know when you when you think about auto racing at least m me current era when I think about auto racing I think about cars starting a race all at one time and you know Le Mans the history of the running to the cars and starting the cars and getting them off the line altogether been a long and storied uh, part of that particular race and it's changed obviously significantly no longer do they run to the car and start running before getting fully belted in um, but this race, the Targa Florio, 
driven around uh, mountain roads on, in Sicily, Italy. The roads were too narrow and dangerous to really do a traditional racing start where there would be a lot of calamity at the start of the race with people passing each other and potentially uh, running into each other. So they chose to start this race as a rally start, so it started in intervals. So basically you uh, drew straws, drivers uh, drew lots to figure out where they were going to start, and then uh, cars would leave one minute after the preceding car. It was a multi-class event. So there certainly was overtaking, which required a little bit of skill, I would imagine, on these narrow little roads at pace. And like so many things in the early 70s, uh, there were a lot of safety concerns around the race, inconvenience to people that lived here, um, and probably the fact that uh, with the fuel embargo and other things going on in world politics and, and the fact that uh, with all of that, people tended to want more fuel-efficient cars. It changed the face of motor racing and the, the value of a race like this. It's kind of a shame. The track was a really kind of interesting... Uh, with all its twists and turns, there's a lot of opportunity for a driver to get into a bad situation. As I'm sure, I'm sure to demonstrate at some point. Um, <laughs> unlike traditional races where you had like a place where you pulled into the pits and uh, did your service, teams were allowed to put fueling stations all over the course. So Porsche, for instance, you know, had, you know, half dozen or so fueling stations all over. So if a driver ran out of fuel, they could opportunistically stop and re refill their tank and get back going again. The race uh, had multiple versions of a mountainous course, um, the longest of which was 144 kilometers long, which I'm sure was a sight to behold. The final versions uh, on which this race was run were a 72 kilometer course, which is the representation that we're driving on right now. It's about 45 miles, give or take. known to go six or seven hours so the reason why that like boggles my mind is you can tell it's a lot of turns more so than like at Le Mans for instance I mean Le Mans has some turns but there's also tremendously long straights where like you could knit a sweater going down Milsan not really but this track constantly in motion constantly turning I mean, there are some long straights towards the end of the course, but for the most part, this is treacherous mountain road. The driver's doing a lot of work, so six or seven hours of this, even with just two drivers, although there were some drivers that drove it solo, which redefines Iron Man in my book.
it's a pretty, pretty humongous task. Even in sim, this is tough to just drive around one lap on this course and maintain your focus the entire way around. You start getting tired, the uh, visuals start misshifts. <laughs> you start missing indicators for turns where you underestimate the turns or overestimate them and slow yourself down. Although this race, while speed was a component, it wasn't all about speed. It was about surviving the race on treacherous roads. So the cars that were more reliable did better. In fact, the car that I'm driving right now, the 904-8, Porsche 904-8, um, fastest version of the 904 that was uh, on track for the 1964 Arca And uh, one of them got out to a blistering lead and then had some suspension problems. A shock mount, something came loose on the car um, and it, they had to repair it, set them back. And they wound up finishing sixth. Although that year, the other 904s that were entered in were the four cylinder variety and uh, finished first and second in class and overall. So the Porsche 904, I have a love affair with this car, mostly because of its moniker in the commercialization of it. So uh, 904 was uh, thought up, created, you might say, 1963. Um, they had them ready to race. 1964 and uh, they of course started using the flat 4 engine that had been so successful in the racing of the 718 Spider, the 550 Spider and the 356 Um, they used a variation of that. They did modify it. Quite a lot. It became a, quite a complicated motor. Um, with uh, not the least of those complications being... Uh, a complicated quad cam setup. And a... Uh, construction of a head that was uh, hemispherical, so hemispherical cylinder heads. You might recognize that um, Dodge in 51, I believe, trademarked the term Hemi, referring to hemispherical heads. Uh, it's a construction or design that uh, gives the car more power by the geometry of the head shapes so provided for inclusion of larger valves so the engine gets better airflow, both the intake and exhaust. And uh, also a uh, centralized spark plug allowing for a more clean power stroke with the, uh, the explosion, the detonation. Pretty neat stuff. Pretty geeky, I know, I'm sorry. Um, but that's what gave, uh, well, it's what gives the, the Hemi, the Dodge Hemi, its power. Um, it's what gave these little two liter engines so much power. So the, uh, the four cylinder lap four that was put in the 904 was uh, capable of 180 brake horsepower. That's pretty incredible. Um, the street versions, the commercial versions that they sold to customers were tuned down to 
155. But still, not 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 too much to sneeze at there. That's a pretty decent. Uh, Decent power for a, a two-liter engine. Although Porsche and their factory, they built three engines or three engines uh, that were based on the uh, Formula One car that Porsche had devised in '61. Uh, Flat eight, 225 brake horsepower, um, some really gnarly carburation. and put them in three of the factory cars. Only three. Called them 9048s, which is what this is that I'm driving. And, uh... They were fast. No joke about it. As I said, uh, one of them took off of the lead in the 1964 Targa Florio. They won a few other races as well. They had a really nasty habit of uh, having the flywheel explode on them, though. <laughs> so reliability wasn't their strong suit as engines. They actually had to detune them quite a bit um, in order to keep them from flying apart. And they also did some magic in terms of uh, the uh, firing sequence of the engine to keep them more stable. But the four, the flat four, was what was in the bulk of the uh, the 904s that were produced. Only 108 were actually built out of a 200 plant, and the majority of them had the the flat four in it. By 1965, this car had had some success and uh, they decided that they were going to uh, replace the, the four and the eight with something a little bit more reliable, a little bit more powerful than the four, which was the flat six that had been designed, built for the new at that time 911. a 200 brake horse flat six again in the two liter category so all of these engines were two liters so they were classed in that were meant to be classed as that in GT competition and of course the uh, that flat six is what showed up in the 906 in uh, 1965 as well and replaced the 904 on racetracks. 904 though has a really solid place in history as being the last competition capable Porsche that was in actual GT races as it was sold to customers and was still streetable, was easily street drivable. Now, I say that knowing full well that somebody out there, maybe maybe Mike Hinton, I don't know, is going to say, no, wait a second, the 906 was the last street legal Porsche race car, and you'd be 100% correct. But there's a argument to be made as to whether or not that car was actually drivable. <laughs> it was street legal, yes. It was it street drivable, probably not. It was a little bit unsettling to drive that car. It was super, super fast, a little bit sketchy, skittish. Um, a true race car, even though it was technically street legal. Um, it was not something that you would go and uh, go grab milk at the corner market in. This is definitely a spirited sports car in the same regard as the 911 is. But... Uh, The 906 was not. Anyway.
I love I love the 904. Um, it was uh, branded the Carrera GTS, and that's a brand that is used even today for 911s that are Gran Turismo sport cars. They're uh, spirited in the sense that they they feel race car capable, but are also meant for for touring. And uh, that's definitely what this car, I think, was. The idea that uh, every Porsche is a race car was the spirit of this 904. And uh, it's carried through in that name, that Carrera GTS name. Whether it's applied to a uh, 911 or not. I have no idea if... I have to assume that when this race was being run that the roads were closed for public traffic. They are public roads. are public mountain roads. But uh, I can't imagine that uh, it would be safe to have a racing event on a road that was actually being actively used by the public at the same time. Though I don't know that that's... not what happened. I, I just assume... funny I, I know I can use the whole track and in some turns I am because I kind of have to but I have this tendency to want to stay in my own lane no didn't mess up the steering that's good Man, this is a crazy road. So this uh, 9048, the uh, flat eight version. Of this car was uh, capable of a top speed of 161 miles an hour. You could do zero to 60 in six seconds. And by modern standards, that doesn't sound all that fast. But considering the day, that was pretty spick and quick. driven cars that are faster than that, but I also know a lot of cars that are slower than that. And that's a uh,
trying to keep the car in the power band, which has been in second gear most of the time through this. As she uh, redlines at uh, 8,000. It's getting the most most uh, power at about 7,200. Amazing car. For its day, it also had a pretty amazing drag coefficient of 0.34, which... The reason why that's so impressive is it's, it's a good number. It's a decent number for a sports car in terms of aerodynamics, but they did that without use of a wind tunnel. The 906 was the first car to be designed with a wind tunnel by Porsche. So they did it by eye and did a pretty darn good job of it. I think I'm remembering correctly that uh, due to homologation problems with this car, it didn't have enough that were actually built and uh, the GT rules were kind of funny in that um, in order to race a car in, a, in certain classes, it had to be a car that was available to the public in certain numbers. And so uh, Porsche always struggled with this, as did Ferrari actually. Um, because they were more bespoke in the day and having to hit those numbers was a real challenge with new designs especially and so I believe if I'm not mistaken at least for the first part of 64 this car had to run in the prototype class and I think for this race I mentioned that they won in class and overall I think that they were running in the prototype class in 64 and when they won this race. Because they didn't quite have all the numbers of cars built yet. And as I said, of the 200 cars planned, they only made 108 of them. And if you've ever been to Ren Sport Reunion, you will have seen at least a handful of representations of this particular car. car when it was originally made for sale in the US market it cost less than $7,300 of course in 63 64 that was a right size more money than uh, it is in today's dollars but makes you want to time travel though doesn't it Saw the grass grow, that was kind of funny. It 
something else that's really funny. I, I'm a tall guy. I'm. People say that when they meet me that that I'm much taller than they think I am based on my videos, which is always funny to me. It cracks me up. Um, but I am six three. And this car, when it was sold, even in the commercial market, had fixed bucket seats. It means they were not adjustable, like in today's modern seats, where you can you know move them up, move them down. So to accommodate different size drivers, they had adjustable pedals that could be moved forward and backwards. Imagine uh, sharing this car with somebody. I, uh, it would be really inconvenient. So it's kind of a one-person car. It's fascinating, though. Easier to move the pedals than it was to put the seat on rails and accommodate uh, them moving. Interesting design decision. Priorities. That's, I guess, one of the reasons it's it's hard to take a car that's really meant for racing and make it available as a commercial car um, for, for street driving for people. You have to compromise in some different places for safety and performance reasons, making it a very difficult challenge, which is why they don't do it anymore. Imagine they didn't give the drivers much time to uh, do reconnaissance on the road ahead of the drive. So you, if you were like a first year driver or hadn't driven it in a year and you come out here, your memory of it was probably pretty vague or your knowledge of it was probably pretty, pretty vague. You were driving out here, balls out, trying to win a race. Probably touched the brakes a lot less frequently than I am.
after your first lap or so, you probably got a little bit more comfortable. Of course, that's a handful of turns. I think thousands um, is maybe an overstatement, at least on this course, but maybe I'm wrong. I would imagine uh, if it, the 144 kilometer course is uh, this twisty, that would definitely have probably thousands of turns. But. Some of these turns, just like, what? So yeah, this car was designed by uh, Ferdinand Alexander Porsche. Ferdinand Alexander Porsche, also known affectionately as Bootsy, although I have never heard the reason why Bootsy. That's an interesting name. First uh, Porsche with a fiberglass body. Fiberglass body built on a steel ladder chassis, which is uh, interesting all trying to get the weight down on a sports car. Also meant if you hit things, it probably wasn't really good for them. The, the amount of turns, there's like no rest, and it really does start to get tiring. And they used to do, you know, 10 or 11 laps of this. The driver would stop when they needed tires and fuel.
which would also allow them the option, in most cases, to switch drivers. Stone, my favorite. She understeers a bit. So this is the one long straight on this entire course. And it's terrifying. Because this car is wanting to move all over the place right now. Let's see if we can get every bit of that 161. It's 160, 161, 162, 63, 65. Getting close to my red line now. 67. Sixty-eight. Here, there. Start finishes up here. 
past our pits, but I figured I'd do a full lap. There it is. That's a full lap. At the Targo Florio in the Porsche 904-8. Woof. That was a drive. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, um, and I hope uh, the little history uh, factoids were interesting and didn't bore you senseless, and uh, I hope you come back and see me again some other time. Next one. Bye now.